Hi, everybody. It's 12 noon, so we are going to get started. My name is Rebecca Nevedale, and I'm with the Arizona Partnership for Immunizations, TAPI, your state vaccine coalition. And today is July 8th, 2021. So if you're listening to a recording, some of this stuff may have changed. I, uh, I'd also like to introduce Macrina. Uh, Macrina, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. Happy Here's July 8th. Happy July 8th. <laughs> um, this is our third, third virtual tips training session for the summer. So we're excited to be back. And all of our recordings are emailed to whoever registered for the session um, a few days after. And they're also on our website. But we're going to do like a two minute recap of what we talked about two weeks ago. We focused on vaccine basics and the ASIP schedule. So we talked about the different types of immunity, the different types of vaccines. So remember, our immune system has three main functions. It wants to detect a germ or bacteria or a virus or you know a nasty. It wants to fight that germ. And then it creates those all important memory cells that remember how to fight that germ so that next time it sees it, it can do so without making us too sick. So scientists look at germs and bacteria and viruses and figure out what about that germ makes us sick. And based on what makes us sick, they think about which type of vac which type of technology they should use to create a vaccine to help us get that immune response, create those memory cells without making us sick. So really all these different types are just different technologies that we use to make vaccines. We also reviewed all of the different schedules uh, for ACES, talked about uh, the importance of sticking to the schedule. This is what's studied. This is what we know works. There are schedules for children, uh, different schedules for adults, and then there's also a catch-up schedule for kids uh, who may have fallen behind on their, on their vaccine schedule. And there's lots of different tips and tools uh, to help you help your patients stick to that schedule. We recommend that you have a calendar available in each exam room. Uh, we have free ones on our website if you want to order some for your exam rooms to hang on the wall. Remember to count the weeks between shots. And remember to always check the age of a child to make sure they're actually the age that they need to be. So we know a lot of moms will say, ah, he's a year old when really the child's 11 months, one day. So make sure that you actually check that age, check the age of all of your patients. We also sent out an evaluation and there were a couple things that popped up that we might need to, that we weren't too clear about. So the first one was we had a question about the meningococcal schedule. So Macrina, tell us about the meningococcal schedule. Okay, so there is there are two meningococcal vaccines out there. So there's one, which is uh, men ACWI, which is the one that we give to kiddos um, between 11 and 12. They get the first dose um, between 11 and 12, and then they'll get a second dose at 16 years of age. Um, then there's meningococcal B. Now we can't, there's, science doesn't allow them to combine the um, ACWI with um, the B. So the meningococcal B, that first dose is given at 16 years of age. Um, and depending on which vaccine you choose, there's either two doses or three doses. And the three dose sometimes can be a two dose series. Um, so the best thing to do is to, when it comes to meningococcal B is remember that um, that is when you're older, 16 and older, and that just make sure that you know the schedule for the specific vaccine manufacturer that you're using and make sure that you know which vaccine manufacturer they receive for the first dose when they return. All right, so if you're still unclear, chat it in and we'll try and answer your questions or um, you know, always feel free to email us too if you have mm -hmm. some things that you want to back and forth, ask Macrina. So, we also had some stuff pop up on the evaluation about co-administering COVID vaccines. Yes, you can give a COVID vaccine with any other vaccine uh, that you are giving. That uh, changed, I don't know, a couple months ago, I think now. 
Right. It came when um, when the COVID vaccines were eligible for kiddos 12 and older. Um, that's when they came with the recommendation that you can actually co-administer vaccines with COVID vaccine. And people were asking specifically about flu. So they, until flu expired June 30th, we could have been administering both COVID and flu. We don't expect that change this year. Right? We don't expect that to change. There's no flu vaccine right now, but we don't expect that to change. Um, but again, anything COVID vaccine, you just need to, to check on it constantly. Yeah. Uh, so there were questions on the evaluation about um, administration. In two weeks, we're going to talk in detail about administration for babies, for grownups, for little kids. So save your questions for then and feel free to keep putting them on the evaluations because we'll actually look at that as we prepare for that session. And then there was another one about how do you interpret shot records from other countries? Well, how we normally do it is at the back of the pink book, there is a section, <coughs> excuse me, that actually has all of the um, immunization, the vaccine types translated. So you can go in there by whichever language or country that um, folks are coming from and you can pretty well match it up. Um, I would have to say about 95% of the time we're able to actually interpret a vaccine record from another country. And what is shocking to us is that we always get immunization records from other countries with a lot of our refugee families. Routinely, we can't get records from Texas, um, but it's a great resource. The yeah. So if you're coming from Syria, you likely have your shot record, but if you're coming from Texas, you probably don't, so. Correct. <laughs> um, so there's a question about how do we get the pink book and we'll make sure to put that link um, in there. It is free from CDC, I think online, you know, the electronic version. And I think there might be an app too. Isn't there a pink book app? Yes, there's a pink book app. And I really do recommend that you go ahead and, and go online to check that pink book because they up every time the ACIP or CDC makes a recommendation change, they actually go directly in and they update it. So actually go, checking it online is a great resource. Great. All right. The other thing that we do at this time is do our raffle for everybody who was nice enough to do um, fill out the evaluation. So our first prize is going to be a $50 gift card. $50 is a lot of money. $50 gift card. If you work in Alicia's office, she might not necessarily share that any of that with you. Um, and Alicia, just be sure to put your, somebody will private chat you for your address. So make sure that you do that where you So this one is for our vaccine book, children's book. And that. because I like this wheel better than last week's wheel. And it's going to be for a t-shirt. Oh, thank you. Um, so be sure to fill out those evaluations because you too can win a $50 prize or a really cool t-shirt or book. Okay, so let's jump in. Uh, today, oh, I'm getting an echo. So whoever's doing that, can you help me with my echo? There we go, okay. So today we're gonna talk about vaccine storage and handling. This is a really important topic because proper storage and handling makes sure that we don't waste any vaccines and there is not enough vaccine in the world for us to be wasting it and people worldwide are really waiting uh, for that vaccine. So we have a really short video here to help you uh, give that perspective. Manger tout manger ah oui. Vous qu'on quitte non? Parce que je n'ai pas besoin de mon pile.
Selimun. Oh, I love that video. I know. Thing. I've seen that one before. It's because I love that video. So if you've been to Chips, you've seen it before. But it's just a good reminder that, you know, all moms really want their babies healthy and safe. Um, and, and I like that it gives a perspective of, you know, there are people all over the world protecting that cold chain and making sure that vaccines are safe for every patient wherever they receive them. So uh, that process looks very different than the cold chain protection in the US for sure. But there was most definitely a data logger sitting in that cooler that went across across that river um, and through the motorcycle and through the jungle and into that arm. So Macrina, talk to us about the cold chain. So the cold chain, I mean, the cold chain starts at the beginning. I mean, it starts when the manufacturers creating vaccines, bottle it all bottling, I guess, or vialing vaccines. And um, they actually store them um, at their location before they ship them off to the distributor who then has to maintain that cold chain. They use data loggers, they monitor it. Um, and then it gets shipped out to us. And through that whole process, even UPS or FedEx has a responsibility in the cold chain um, because that vaccine is labeled perishable. Um, and then it gets to us. And then when it gets to us, we have responsibility for um, unpacking it, storing it appropriate temperatures, monitoring it. And then there's even handling um, that we need to do when we take the vaccine from one place to another place to administer it. So we all have a part. And we all need to know what we're doing. So who needs, who needs to be trained on storage and handling? You know, I think everyone in an office needs to understand or have a basic understanding of storage and handling. The person at the front desk needs to know when that package arrives and it says perishable vaccines, they need to know that their job is to make sure that they notify somebody so it can be um, unpacked, inventory, make sure that um, it's a proper temperature and stored appropriately. They need to know who to contact and if that person's not there, who's the other person to contact. Um, if that person comes in and sees that the electricity is out, they need to know. So I think everyone has a responsibility in um, the vaccine cold chain and monitoring storage and handling. Um, how often is actually once a year required by um, BFC, but it's also anytime we get a new vaccine. It's anytime a vaccine storage and handling may change. And as all of us know, with COVID, that's about every 48 hours, it seems like. Um, yeah, and included in, in your new employee onboarding process. So anybody who is new to your office, make sure that they are also, you know, up to speed on storage and handling. Because keep in mind that that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty valuable commodity um, for your physician or your um, hospital group or your provider group. That's a pretty expensive um, commodity that's in that refrigerator and freezer. Number one, and number two, you know how hard it is to get shots into kiddos. Um, you wanna make sure that you're giving them vaccine that is still effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talk to us about temperatures. Okay, so your refrigerator is stored at between 36 to 46, 40 is the ideal temperature. And then your freezer is between 58 and negative 58 and five Fahrenheit. Um, as you can see, there's water bottles in those units. And those water bottles are really sort of your safety net um, because in the refrigerator, if your refrigerator goes out, it will help that remain that, that safe temperature um, for a length of time until either your electricity comes back up or your unit um, is working properly or until you have time to get into your facility um, and pack it up and move it. Same with the freezer. You're gonna put water bottles in there, they're gonna freeze, and that's gonna help maintain that temperature um, in case something goes bad. It gives you a little time. It's like sort of your safety net. You always wanna make sure you have a do not unplug. Um, you'd be amazed at how many times it gets unplugged so that they can wax the floor or vacuum the carpet, and sometimes doesn't get plugged back in. So make sure you have a plug guard and a note that says do not unplug. And do you write do not drink on the bottles? Um, we do not. You could write do not drink 
or you can put a note on your refrigerator door, um, not drinkable water. We usually say not drinkable water because then people think it's unsafe. And yeah. I definitely won't get it even if they're desperate. And, and then aren't we, do you hang something on the fridge too that shows the temps, what they're supposed to be? Right. When you're monitoring temperatures, what um, what we do is you have a you have a, a a chart on the refrigerator. And my favorite type of chart is actually one where the safe ranges are highlighted. So when you go in there, it'll tell you what the temperatures are. And always document what you want your temperatures to be. Um, for example, on our refrigerator, it says between 36 and 46. You know that if you come out and go to document um, 34, that that's not right and you need to do something. Mm -hmm. um, same with your freezer, put the temperature that it's supposed to be right on the front and make sure you use Fahrenheit or Celsius. Don't use Fahrenheit and Celsius. There's no better system to um, create heartache than by using two um, type of temperatures. Yeah, so if you're using Celsius on the fridge, use Celsius on the freezer. Correct. And, you know, mistakes happen. Fridges and freezers, you know, start to die. Um, this time of year, it's like we're getting ready really for monsoon too. So in a second, we'll talk about emergency plans. But we know there's been lots of questions about COVID. So we thought that we would make sure that go over storage and handling specific for those COVID vaccines. Right, so um, when COVID comes to you, it's going to be at an ultra cold temperature. Um, and most of you don't have ultra cold freezers. So you can store that at your typical um, freezer, whatever you store your MMR and varicella in for up to two weeks. And then um, at two weeks, you then can move that vaccine to your refrigerator between 36 and 46, which is what we store all other vaccines at for up to 31 days as long as that vaccine vial is not punctured. So that's for Pfizer. For Pfizer. And now Moderna. Um, so Moderna is stored in your freezer. Negative 50, negative 15, just like, or 58, negative 58 to five Fahrenheit, just like your um, all your other frozen vaccines. Um, and then that you store in the freezer until the expiration date or until you want to use it. Then you're going to move it into your refrigerator again 36 to 46 degrees um, just like all your other vaccines and you can store it there for up to 30 days as long as it's not punctured as well um, and this expiration and when you move it to the refrigerator it's good for 30 days and our one and done and yes our one and done our j and j um, this is, again, stored in regular refrigerator, 36 to 46. Um, and then until the expiration date, and then once you puncture the vial, it's only good for six hours. Again, none of these COVID vaccines have preservatives. And that's why we really do have specific um, guidelines on once that vial is punctured, it's only good for a certain amount of time. Yeah, so CDC has said, I know it's been really, um, you know, CDC has told us that when we think about COVID vaccine right now, we really want to think about not wasting any arms. So if you have a patient in front of you that says yes, and you have a J&J &J that you're going to need to puncture, and you don't think it's already five o'clock, you're not sure if you're going to find anybody in the next six hours to finish that vial, that's okay. Uh, when it comes, we are still in the middle of a pandemic when it comes to COVID-19 vaccine. We want to not wait, we don't want to waste the patients. You know, we don't want to waste the arms. Correct. Um, COVID vaccine, this is a completely different thought. Um, we do not want to miss an opportunity to immunize anybody. I had two people that showed up for vaccine. They wanted vaccine. They had been thinking about it for a while. I had to puncture a vial of Pfizer, which has six doses, but I successfully immunized two people a 14 year old and an adult who had told me she'd been thinking about it for months and had finally made up her mind. So with this vaccine, never miss an opportunity. You are perfectly okay to use whatever doses you can. If you cannot administer the rest, do not worry about it. But we still wanna do our best 
in protecting that vaccine. We don't want to waste it because you didn't keep it at the right temperature or because you know some there was a breakdown in your process. So let's talk about emergency plans in agreement. Okay, so you always want to have an emergency plan. And there is a, an emergency plan in the VFC ops guide, but you're really going to make need to make one specific to you. Um, how are you going to be notified if your vaccine um, units or the electricity goes out during non-working hours? Where are you going to move vaccine to? Do you have equipment? Do you have um, vaccine storage units, ice chests? Do you have ice and, and cold? cold pack to move that vaccine. The one thing that you really need to make sure you have is a data logger. You need to have that backup data logger because if you move vaccine and you do not have that data logger to monitor the temperature, VFC will assume that the vaccine was not transported um, within proper temperature range and may make you waste it. So again, I, I can, I just need to drive home the point, have that backup data logger in case you have to move vaccine. So what, so if there's a temp excursion for power outage or whatever reasons, what, what are their steps if it is VFC vaccine? So if it's VFC vaccine, what you're gonna do is you're gonna label the vaccine that it's not, label the vaccine do not use and you're gonna call VFC immediately. Um, now VFC is available Monday through Friday, eight to five. So if this happens after hours um, or on weekends, you're gonna again, label it and wait and give them a call first thing um, in the morning. If it's non-VFC vaccine, what you're going to need to do is um, call the manufacturer for each vaccine. Now both VFC and the manufacturers are gonna to wanna to have a little bit of information. Number one is what temperature was it at? What was the coldest or the warmest temperature that it was at? How long do you think it was at that temperature? And that's why the data logger comes in really handy. That's why you need that data logger. You can give them that information. And then um, they will be able to tell you, is the vaccine viable for use? Does the, Sometimes what they'll do is they'll shorten the expiration date. Um, instead of the expiration date being out six or eight months, it could be out two months. Um, but they will actually be able to tell you what to do with that vaccine, whether it's usable or whether it needs to be um, discarded. And if it's COVID vaccine? You're gonna call ADHS, you're gonna call the VFC group. So a little bit of a different process if there's an excursion for each of those types of vaccine. Um, once they're labeled, shut the door. You did not grow up in a barn. That's what you tell your kids every day after school when they sit in front of the open fridge. Uh, but just like if your power goes out at home, you know, you don't open that freezer because that's a lot of meat that's going to spoil. So make sure that you keep the doors shut after they're labeled. Right. And then so whatever you do, at, you know, when the electricity goes out or something, whatever you do at home to make sure your food stays safe is exactly what you're going to do in your facility to make sure your vaccine stays safe. And we've talked about transporting vaccines. So for VFC, we're still not transporting any vaccine, correct? Correct. Yeah, so for VFC, you won't be transporting vaccine. But for a COVID vaccine, uh, we do have permission to transport it with data loggers. So I just want to make sure that that's that. Um, but data loggers are also in, their, in the fridge and the freezer too. So what are the kind of our best practices tips for data loggers? Um, well, you're going to check the temperature twice a day. Um, you're going to use the same measure measurement again. You're going to label the front of the units with what is the appropriate temperature. Um, and you're going to um, label next to the temp logs. If this is inevitably the most common error, and it happens, is that when you look at the um, temperature log, you discover that folks have been documenting um, 31.9, 32, 34, um, and they do it for a week or two. Sometimes having that big sign on the refrigerator that says 36 to 46 will stop you when you, when you see a temperature that's out of range. So if we lose, there's a question in the chat uh, from Jennifer, if we lose power and if the 
will not go back within a reasonable time frame. We don't transport to our rescue facility. Yes. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. The only for V for vac for VFC vaccine, the only rule that allows you to transport is if you your electricity does go out and it doesn't come back in a reasonable time frame. Then you will transfer it to. I love that term, rescue facility. You mm -hmm. love that. I'm going to start using it. Um, you will transfer to your um, rescue facility. Make sure you have a data logger with it. Make sure you monitor the temp and then notify um, ADHS. Um, so what was mean when it said you can't, so for VFC vaccine, if, if it's, there's not a, a power outage that you see no end in sight for, you cannot transfer, transport that VFC vaccine from like ABC Patty, pediatrics in Pine Top to ABC pediatrics in Lakeside. That can't happen. Um, but for COVID vaccines, we are able to uh, transport to make sure that we use those doses as long as it's done so properly with the data loggers and all that. Correct. And if and if your power excursion, I saw that if your power outage is for a short period of time and your vaccine can maintain those safe temperature ranges and you do not need to move it. Um, we don't transport vaccine as long as our refrigerator re maintains within those temperature ranges. Um, we, there's no need to move it. What would you consider a reasonable time frame? That's hard. You know, it's really hard. So we we sort of notice that when the when we start to see the temperature go down, um, we sort of start getting everything ready when we start seeing the temp get down to about 35, 34, because um, we know it moves slowly and it gets down to about 34, thir not 34, I'm sorry, I was totally wrong, disregard, I never said 34. When it gets down to um, like 38, 39, we'll start, to, we'll start to rally the troops. Yeah. So Denise is saying, I have three data loggers, I'm sending in my backup for calibration, how do I cover that? You need a backup to the backup. The other issue is that if you truly have to transport vaccine because of a power outage or because of a malfunctioning unit, you can pull one of those data loggers out of the unit itself and use that to transport vaccine. All right. I'm gonna give just another set. I'm gonna launch this poll. If you still have questions, put it in the chat, but we're curious to hear what errors have you seen in your practice? And you're allowed to be honest, Macrina has even made a mistake or two in her time. <laughs> but the mistake, these things just happen, you know? I mean, they're breakdown in processes. Just and there's so many variables, right? I mean, so you expect a mom to bring in one kiddo and she brings in two and asks, can you immunize this kiddo? Or, you know, I've had the issue where the mom is, you know, I have twins and they're not on the same schedule. And so mom holds one twin when I think I'm immunizing the other. That's you just learn from them and you put processes in place so they don't happen again. And you can share them with your um, colleagues so they can learn from your mistakes. I think that's the most important thing. Is, to, is, is just to learn from them and share. Yeah, if you make a mistake, don't hide it, just share it, because it's more than likely a process issue, you know? Um, and, and they do happen for all sorts of reasons. When, when the vaccine coordinator is on vacation or on maternity leave, mistakes happen then too, so. Uh, so we'll give you just one more second, and these are kind of interesting to see. Okay. So most popular mistake looks like it is not using vaccine with the soonest expiration date first. How do you how do you prevent that? Oh, how we prevent it is we um we just come up with a really simple system where we take um, paper and we just write um, the expiration date and we put them in between. And so we know that the shortest is up front and then the next and the next. Um, so we make sure that the easiest one to grab is the one with the shortest expiration date. 
That's good. Another one is vaccines left on the counter unattended. That happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So some offices we've heard, if you have any like ideas about how to reduce these errors or processes you've put in place, go ahead and throw them in, in the chat so that you can share those. Some offices, when that's happened, you know, repeatedly, uh, maybe there's a lot of turnover in the front desk where they're using kind of temp work for six months while someone's on FMLA or something like that. They uh, create policies so that only one, you know, the only one person can sign for that or only two or three people can sign for that, uh, for those perishable boxes. Um, not having a, having only one person is bad. <laughs> and it looks like that's happened a few times. People have, have said that that's a pretty popular mistake. Um, Macrina's favorite is, is that documenting out of range, but not doing anything. Right, people just, we document it so that we make sure it's the right temperature. Um, yeah, but that's actually my favorite and you think it's not that easy to happen, but you know what, it happens. I just saw, we now have signs for deliveries, won't be accepted after five. We um, had an entire um, shipment of varicella get wasted because it was back to school time and the um, UPS driver didn't want to go through the crowd in the clinic. So he just figured he'd return. Um, and you know, you can't keep varicella sitting on a hot UPS truck over the weekend. So um, now we have signs on all of our back doors that say all deliveries must go through the front. If unable, call this number. Mm -hmm. you, just, you just don't know some things are going to happen until they happen. It's just knowing when they happen, tell your, you know, your supervisor, your leadership, and, and feel free to keep asking, how are we going to fix that so that it doesn't happen again? You know, if it happened once, more than likely it will happen again. And there's three people who have seen lunches next to vaccines in the fridge. One time um, we saw a picture of some of a really old fridge years ago with a brown bag lunch next to it. So, um, but all of this is why we need standard operating procedures. You really need to know who's doing what and when, have it written down. It's gonna help your training processes go smoother and it's gonna help you to reduce errors. BFC, the operations guide is a really, really fabulous resource. And remember, vaccine does not know it's VFC or not. Whatever you're doing for your VFC vaccine, you should be doing for your private as well. It's going to make things a lot smoother, um, a lot easier, and you don't have to know what the different, there won't be different rules for different vaccines. Storage and handling is pretty cut and dry. It's pretty black and white. So, um, CDC, and we did put that these resources in the chat already. You call the shots and the vaccine storage and handling guide as well. So me, be sure to check those things out. And again, we, you really want to do this. All your staff, anyone who has anything to do with vaccines needs this when they're hired as part of their new employee onboarding annually. You want to make sure you do it in service with everyone once a year. Anytime there's a change to recommendations and anytime a new vaccine gets added to the schedule. So we just always put the um, you call the shots as part of your um, professional development goals each year. And so if you want to if you want to pass that, then you have to take it. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. Um, yep. Not only will they take it, but then you have to document it when you do the evaluation. So it's sort of it helps the supervisor. Um, it helps the staff person. So just put a part of your performance plan. Okay, so make sure you're trained, have it all written down. Make sure you are not the only one who knows everything there is to know about vaccines. If you are, you need to go to your practice manager or your doc like immediately and say, I'm gonna need to train somebody else because we really want you to take vacation sometimes. Um, remember to check your your temps twice a day, write them down, make sure everyone knows that when you're documenting something out of range, it means you need to tell someone or do something about it. If you're using Celsius, use Celsius. If you're using Fahrenheit, use Fahrenheit. Uh, have the, those were some great tips written in about how to reduce, how to make sure you use what's gonna expire first, first. 
and also about how to make sure that those boxes don't end up sitting, uh, you know, over the course of a weekend on somebody on the front desk um, and make sure you have your emergency plan. So we're gonna, so we, the vaccines have left the manufacturing plant. They have traveled through FedEx or UPS. They've gotten to your facility. They've been properly stored and handled at the same time your patients have been scheduling appointments or you've been scheduling appointments for them or doing reminder recall. So there's two kinds of screenings that we're gonna talk about. First, you need to, your office needs procedures to screen for whether a vaccine is due, is the patient due for a vaccine what, at all different steps in your scheduling process. So best practice is to make sure you check vaccine status for any sick visit and any well visit because they can get vaccines at most of those visits anyway as long as they don't have a you know a really high fever already so when a patient schedules make sure that your that your scheduling process allows you to look in the medical record to see if they're going to be due so that you can tell the patient you're also going to be due for your shingles vaccine or your child's also due for you know, an MMR and you can make sure that they're prepared for that. Uh, when you do your chart prep the day before, make sure that you look in ACES and look in the medical record to see if that patient is due. And remember when a patient checks in to remind them that they're gonna be receiving those vaccines today, especially um, you know, with co if you're offering COVID vaccine in your clinic, you know, people that they're gonna have questions right away. So making sure that you um, give them the opportunity to get the what's front of mind out and be able to make sure they feel empowered um, and comfortable to get that vaccine. So we're going to talk about screening basics because the other screen that we're doing is looking to see if they have contraindications or precautions. And this is your actual screening checklist, right? Right. We actually um, use a screening checklist. Um, I, I encourage everyone to do it. Um, some staff don't. We have it in policy here. And just because I can get off track really easily. I mean, sometimes it's just with the first question, is the child sick today? The answer is no, but, and then there's, but this kid is sick and this kiddo is sick and they were exposed to this kiddo. And then all of a sudden I get talking about number one and I never ever get question number eight answered or below. So I use a screening checklist because it keeps me on track, keeps the parent or um, family member on track who's bringing the kid out. Sometimes one question we do add here, especially for our adolescents, is do they have a history of fainting? Um, it's not that we expect them to faint. It's not that fainting is a contraindication. It's just that some adolescents just faint. And we'd like to know that information ahead of time because um, it's actually safer for everyone involved. But I definitely recommend using um, a screening checklist. Um, there's contraindications. Um, and a contraindication can either increase the risk of, a, of an adverse reaction or sometimes a contraindication. Um, and there are two kinds of contraindications, permanent and temporary. And then there's precautions. And these, it may increase the risk of a serious adverse event, or it may actually co compromise the body's ability to build a good immune response. And so those are things that um, Really a precaution is something that the parent is gonna have a discussion with the provider and do you move forward and immunize or not? You do not immunize when there's a contraindication present though. A precaution you may. Again, there, there are three permanent contraindications. One is a severe allergic reaction to a component, encephalopathy or brain swelling within seven days of a um, pertussis containing vaccine. Um, and then uh, severe combined immunodeficiency disorder, and that's only with rotavirus vaccine. There are two temporary contraindications, and these are only to live vaccines, pregnancy and immunosuppression. Um, with pregnancy, you're going to wait until after delivery for a live vaccine, and with immunosuppression, you're going to wait till um, they have recovered. And now we have a different screening checklist for COVID vaccine. Right, so now we have a separate one for COVID vaccine. Um, with this, you're definitely gonna have, want to have them fill this out. If they answer yes to any of these questions or check, um, and number five on there was to check all that apply, 
It does not mean they can't receive the vaccine. It just um, means that that might be a precaution. And in some instances, you might actually want them to wait 30 minutes after being immunized instead of waiting um, 15 minutes. The, the absolute no, you're not gonna immunize with um, a severe allergic reaction, anaphylaxis to polyethylene glycol or polysorbate. And those are both um, sort of stabilizers or fillers in the vaccine. You're not gonna immunize with that. Um, if someone does have an anaphylactic reaction to something other than that, we still immunize, we just will have them wait for 30 minutes. So before you prep the vaccine, you're gonna to wanna to make sure, so we've screened, we've, we've screened for contraindications and precautions. And if they're doing, if you're co-administering, do you, do you give them both? If you're giving a COVID vaccine and a shingles vaccine, do you give them both checklists? Um, yes, we give them both checklists. They okay. have to fill up both. Um, and you also have to give them all the appropriate VISs for the vaccines and then turn around and give them the um, emergency use authorization or that fact sheet as well. So every vaccine for a childhood vaccine or any vaccine, you give them the VIS form. You can find the most up-to-date VIS form on the Immunization Action Coalition website, which is immunize.org. Um, and they change all the time. They have them in all the languages that you need. If you have trouble finding a language, let them know they, you know, they, they have them. If you're giving a COVID vaccine, you give the EUA form. And that's the form that on the top says fact sheets for recipients and caregivers. You know, make sure that you offer them those forms, right? Do they have to right. give EIS and EUA or just offer them? You don't have to give, you can offer. You can also, something that we've actually started using is we've started using QR codes since most smartphones have QR code readers. So we've been using the QR codes and letting folks um, take pictures of it and um, put it on their phone or their tablet. That's also something you can do. Okay, so you just make have to offer it in some form. And remember, if, you're, um, if the, a patient doesn't have a smartphone, then you need to make sure that you have a hard copy on Correct. hand. Correct. And then you're also gonna obtain consent at this time, probably, you know, before you prep the vaccine. Don't get consent after you prep the vaccine. That's just gonna create wastage, so. Um, so let's talk about preparation. So you have done your vitals, you've screened for contraindications and precautions, you've probably talked to the nervous mom or dad. Um, now the provider is going in, you've gotten that consent for the vaccine. You're gonna propose your order uh, if you don't have a standing order or you're gonna check your standing order if you are in a practice that has standing orders. You're gonna get the vaccine, you're gonna double check that vaccine. If you um, grab another MA who's gonna double check that vaccine for you, make sure that, that that MA reads the standing order. If you're double checking for somebody else, you have to actually read the order and you have to actually look at the vaccine to double check it. Uh, don't just say, yeah, and you know sign off and move on. It's really important. You have no idea what, what that girl did that morning or how long it took her to get her kid out of bed and how awake she is. So make and when sure double checking vaccine, make sure you pull out the right vaccine, but also make sure you double check the expiration date. Correct. Yes. Thank you. For that. Um, then you're going to wash your hands, prep the vaccine and label it. But let's talk about washing your hands because Macrina, we have not talked about this and enough in the last two years and washing and washing for 20 seconds. You all know how long 20 seconds can be. Ooh. Um, so you're gonna wash your hands or use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. You're gonna wash your um, hands for vaccine preparation. After you, prep the, after you prep the vaccine, you go back into the room, you're gonna wash your hands again. I always do in front of the client because I think that um, and it's just a good example. Um, gloves are not required for OSHA guidelines to administer vaccines, but I know that a lot of your organizations may require you to wear gloves. Um, so if your organization requires you to wear gloves while giving vaccines, then you need to follow your organization's policy. But if you do see people out there administering vaccines without gloves, um, don't call the news because it's okay. OSHA says it's fine. 
um, safety devices. OSHA also requires that you, um, your organization provides you with a safety syringe. Um, OSHA also requires that staff evaluate which safety syringe is best for their organization. Um, and so there are several out there on the market. So whichever one works best for you, um, familiar, familiarize yourself with it, practice with it if you need to, um, and never recap a used needle, never. Make sure your sharps container is close by. Make sure it's right next to you. Um, you don't wanna cross a crowded room um, and drop it in the sharps container. You want it to be close by. But not in reach of the patient? Not in reach of the patient, but close by. You never wanna lay an uncapped dirty needle on a countertop or on an exam room table. Does anybody remember years and years and years ago, um, a very famous um, local person was giving vaccines on a news channel, as which we all do. We give newscasters flu vaccine during flu season um, because it makes for a good story. And the person did not have a sharps container sitting on the table, gave the vaccine, put the needle on the table, brought the other person over, picked up the needle, gave the vaccine, but gave, but injected, um, well, didn't really inject a person, but used the dirty needle. So that's why it's very important to put the needles back in the sharps, put them back on TV. Yep, on TV. I have never heard that story from you. Yep, this, I just, I just thought about, I just thought about it. <laughs> that's not good. No, it's not, it's not. So that's why those needles need to go in the sharps container. Is there, is there anything else around vaccine prep that we want to go over or is there anything specific for COVID or, and don't aspirate. That's another vaccine prep thing we usually talk about. Yep. No need to, no need to aspirate anymore for us old timers. It took a while for us to stop that. Um, the only difference with COVID vaccine is that um, it is a little bit more gentler. Um, so you really do need to, you know, instead of our MMR and, um, varicella, we can get a little rough with it, you know, and kind of twirl it. <laughs> um, but you're not going to do that with any of these COVID vaccines. You're going to roll it gently between its, your hands. You're going to do this very gently. Um, if you shake it, the recommendation is for you not to use it and to call the manufacturer. So um, it's a very tender and gentle vaccine. So we have, when you get the slides, reminders of all, all these vaccines kind of beyond storage and handling, but we know that these are the newest ones. So do you want to just kind of speed through this? Sure. Um, as we all know, um, Pfizer is 12 and up right now. Um, you need to use the same vaccines for dose one and two of this. So it must be Pfizer for the second dose. Um, it's an IM injection. You do have to reconstitute it but this is with a 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline solution, which is preservative free. So don't accidentally or desperately use your um, MMR and varicella diluent. You have to use a diluent that is supplied with it. Um, and then again, the um, freezer refrigerator um, temperature. And then once it's, once it's mixed in the vial is punctured um, six hours, it's good for it. Okay. And COVID, uh, Moderna, it's 18 and up currently. Um, again, two doses, not interchangeable. Dose one, dose two, both must be Moderna. This is IM. Um, and I think we talked about, um, this is just normal freezer storage, but refrigerator storage up to 30 days. Um, with this vaccine, once you puncture the vial, it is good for 12 hours. So this one's a little bit longer. Um, and again, with any other vaccine, you want to make sure you store it in its um, original container. You don't take it out. Um, once this is thawed, you cannot refreeze it. Um, so once it's in the refrigerator, the 30 days start and you can't refreeze it. And there's a question about in the chat about ordering more than 200 doses of Moderna. And they can do that as long as they put it in the notes, right? Correct. As long as you just put it in the notes that you need more than 200 doses. Just say having a special event, have, you know, need more doses, just a note, and they'll go ahead and approve that. And Johnson and Johnson. 
Oh, the one and done, we like to call it. Um, this again is 18 years of age and up. It's a single dose and I am. Um, again, this is good stored in the refrigerator of 36 to 46 degrees. Um, and this one as well, once the vial is punctured, it's only good for six hours. Um, again, this is because they have no preservatives. And I think that really helps me remember why we have such a short time frame um, once the vial is punctured is there are no preservatives. So we do expect, um, we had put already in the chat that the COVID web, the vaccine web pages that you need to check at least weekly to see if there's any changes to storage and handling. Um, and there's also going to be changes to the labels, right? We expect right. to go down to age two by fourth quarter, I think they're saying. They're saying by September, it, might, it most likely Pfizer will be down to age two. And so far, pretty much every time Pfizer makes a statement, it ends up being true. So we're, we're already starting to plan. How are we going to implement this vaccine into our clinics for everyone to and up? Um, so we're already working on those processes and plans. The other things that will change over time is I'm sure that because they have no preservatives, I'm sure at some point the packaging will change um, mm -hmm. and things like that. So don't get too stressed out about um, the six hours or 12 hours what's punctured and this and that. I, I think things over time will get easier for us. And again, I just put on my calendar, my Outlook calendar. I say check COVID, check COVID CDC. And then it pops up to remind me I have a meeting to check COVID CDC. And I just check it um, twice a week. Because okay. do you all know? Yeah, should I tell the story about how I found out the storage and handling changed on Pfizer? Yeah, that's a good story. So I was um, I was just up late one night and I was listening to Jimmy Fallon, which is shocking in itself because I was up at 1030. Um, and part of his monologue was to talk about how is it a vaccine that needs to be kept at these ultra cold temperatures, all of a sudden can be stored for two weeks in the freezer and 30 days in the refrigerator. What happened? And everyone laughs and I'm like, really? I didn't know that. I came in the next morning just to verify that Jimmy Fallon was correct because you never ever want to take, you know, storage and handling advice from a comedian. Um, and so I came in, I checked it, and that's when I put on my calendar right then and there. I'm going to check two times a week. See, so, problem, and you now there's a new procedure. <laughs> correct. Yeah. Okay, so all of these storage and handling protocols and procedures, you're, you have them documented in, in your SOPs. We have job aid uh, that clearly outline what everyone needs to do for each vaccine um, and, you know, and every, everybody's role in making sure to maintain cold chain. All of this is to prevent errors. Um, so these right here are our eight rights. Uh, spin yeah. through. Yeah, and I know it's, it looks like it's complicated, but it's really not. This is what we do every single day. You know what? Well, we make sure we have the right patient. Again, um, you know, you want to confirm with mom that the little kiddo she's holding on her lap is the kiddo who's due for vaccines that day and the kiddo you screened. So do you have the right patient? Do you have the right vaccine? Did you double check? Um, is the schedule right? Is the timing right? Um, did you do the right dosage? Most vaccines for kiddos are 0.5, but we know that if you're a family practice, you could have adult hep B and pediatric hep B, um, adult hep A, pediatric hep A. So you wanna make sure you're giving the right dosage. Is it the right route? I am sub Q. Um, the site, is it the deltoid? Is it the leg? Um, you wanna make sure you document everything. You need to document the date um, of both the vac that they were vaccinated as well as the date the VIS was published. Um, lot number, expiration date. And then you want to you write the right response, which is a new one that was just added. And, and response being, you know, how do you communicate to the kiddo? How do you, when you're done, talk about follow-up? Um, I always like to say to moms and dads, you know, if legs and arms are a little sore, here's what you can do. Um, if a kiddo has been kicking and screaming a lot, and I feel like there might be a little bruise on the arm, I always tell moms and dads, you know what, there may be a little bruise, um, they were kind of kicking it, kicking a bit. Um, so it just, just kind of keep that in mind. Um, is how you, how you talk to parents about prior to and after. I'm just watching the patient. I mean, I've seen, I was with Macrina when she immunized somebody who was just super anxious. 
about it was a COVID vaccine and was just anxious coming in. And then he's kind of sitting there and looking and she's like, are you okay? Cause you might look, let's make sure you stay seated, you know, and that you're not going to drop on me here. Let's keep talking. Let's stay, stay present together. So, you know, making sure that nothing, what's that immune, re, you know, not immune response, but those little reactions. Yeah. You all know the look. I mean, I'm sure every last one of you know the look of somebody who you think may actually, you know, end up hitting the floor. So, you know, it's, it's too, you sort of say, okay, let's take a deep breath. So what's going on? How are you doing? Um, and that kind of stuff. So sometimes, or make them laugh. Sometimes that'll just take their attention away. Um, but, but you all know that look, I'm sure. Yeah. There's some, there's some stuff going on in the chat about J and J. So before we hang up, I want to make sure that we answer that correctly. Um, going right there. How long can it be stored once punctured? So before the vials are punctured, they can be stored till the expiration date. But after they're punctured, you got six hours or at room temperature for two hours. So six hours in the fridge, two hours at room temperature. And um, there are job, the ADHS job aids or CDC job aids. One of the job aids is in the chat too, to help you with that. Keep those, keep those especially if you're offering all of these different COVID vaccines um, or different products. You know, if you have two vaccine manufacturer products for the same kind of vaccine for whatever reason in your clinic, Keep all those job aids handy and have them look at them. That's what they're there for. You cannot memorize all of this stuff all at once. So we have one more poll that we're going to do, um, and this is to help us get ready for next week's session. So next week, we're going to talk about vaccine administration, but we're also going to talk about how do you overturn those common kind of objections or questions that you're getting for your patients. So the poll here is about kind of regular vaccines, but if you also want to chat in, um, you know, questions you're getting that you just don't know how to answer um, or, or concerns that, that patients are expressing that you just, you don't know how to address, please let us know so that we can next week get some ideas about that. Um, I'm also, there's also the chat, in the chat, a link to the evaluation and you can write those things in there too. Um, there's a, getting back to that, while well, folks are answering that survey, Macrina, getting back to that J and J, it says, what if the vials don't have expiration date? Oh, so the vials don't have expiration date. There's actually a QR code that you zap the QR code and then you, um, that'll pop up with the expiration date. Thank you. The date that is actually on the COVID vaccine is actually the manufacturing date. All right. So I'm gonna leave that poll open. Um, we will make sure next, so next week, or not next week, in two weeks, two weeks, July 22nd, we're gonna talk about administration and talking with patients. We will keep this line open for a little bit to make sure that we get to all the questions. And we will also make sure to email you all the recording and it's all on our website too. Uh, thank you all for all your time and all you do. We know storage and handling is kind of like a lot of numbers and temperatures and not the most exciting topic, but it keeps vaccines safe. Make sure we don't waste any and make sure that they get to around the world to people who really need them. So thanks for all that you do uh, to keep our vaccine system healthy. And Macrina, we had a question about, um, we'll just keep the line open until we get all these questions done. So wondering why the data logger has 12.9 on it. I don't know that. What's the picture? Um, I'm not really sure why it would have 12.9. I don't know. Oh, why this one has 12.9? Yeah. Centigrade. What was that? It's centigrade. If you see it, there's a C next to it. So uh, it's not um, Fahrenheit. Okay. Oh, okay. I didn't understand the question. I thought, wow. Well, 
Mm -hmm. uh, we, I have another question. Um, do we know when the cloud awards are getting mailed out? <laughs> Jen? Oh, you, they, yeah, they, they are still with the printer. They got a little bit slowed down, but you'll be receiving them. They're gonna ship them directly from there for the certificates. And if you've got a framed one, then um, we're gonna try to deliver those because they're, some of those are so big, they crack in the mail. So as soon as we get them back from the printer, we will kind of make arrangements to drop off the big ones or you'll get them in the mail directly from the printer. I know they're a little delayed. It was a, it was a rough time for our print guy. Moderna <laughs> uh, is good. I'm reading the one about how long, once a, once a Moderna vial is punctured, it's good for 12 hours. You know what we didn't really hit really hard is that is, which I think everybody knows, but if you get Pfizer, you have to stick with Pfizer. If you get Moderna, you have to stick with Moderna. Yeah, we, we yeah. talked about it, but didn't hit it real, real hard. But um, yeah, we stick with Pfizer, Pfizer, Moderna, Moderna. But that's every vaccine. I mean, we- Well, that's pretty that. The, the recommendation is that you try to stick with the same manufacturer, but it's not a hard and fast rule. So if you if you by chance have to switch manufacturers for let's say DTAP or DTAP, I guess would be the one, then don't miss an opportunity. But with um, vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, you do need to, if you only have Pfizer and someone needs a second Moderna, then they need to find a second Moderna somewhere. What's the, there's another one that we can't mix though, a teen Meningococcal one. B. Okay. Men B you can't mix. Um, but if a patient inadvertently, if a patient received Pfizer at, you know, a state pod or something and then went to another event and received a Moderna and then they show up in your office. Uh, they're not recommending that you repeat it. Right. Your recommendation right now is to say, don't repeat it. Um, do we waste, can you see that one from Melody in there? Yeah, so what you do is you just notify um, ADHS. Um, and if you have COVID vaccine that's about to expire, just notify ADHS that it's about to expire. And then they will walk you through and, and the wastage process. Um, don't stress out about it. Don't get scared. Don't get nervous. Um, we recognize that this is a new vaccine out there and there's a lot of challenges and especially today. Um, it's not like it was in, Jan in December, January, and February when everyone was running in and um, running over each other to get it. So um, just let the state know. Yeah, exactly. You cannot mix your men bees. You can't give, you have to give two true members or two Vexeros. Not Correct. Kind of, Correct. Another way to say the same thing. Oh, that's what I meant. You can't mix men beads. Yeah. Stick with the same manufacturer. The, um, Sometimes at TIPS, we've heard people making their own combination vaccines. You don't mix your own vaccine. Only the scientists create combination vaccines. But someone did mention, and I thought this was really a smart idea, we do the same thing in our clinic, that if, you're, if you have individual single antigen vaccines, um, you give them separately and not give your combination. Um, for example, if you have DTAP that's soon to expire, um, then you know you don't give the combination vaccines, you go ahead and give the individual vaccine so that you don't waste vaccine. Um, and that's exactly what we do. Oh. Yeah, because you don't want to waste. And if your combination vaccine has a 12 month expiration date and you have 50 doses of DTAP that expire in a month, and you've got the other vaccines and you just give, um, them, give them individually. Yeah. So Christine's saying if a patient recently received a COVID vaccine, is there a waiting period 
to receive another vaccine? And the answer to that is no, no, no. more. No more, nope. The only waiting period for any vaccines are between two live vaccines. And you have to wait how long between two live vaccines? 28 days. Oh, I have a private chat on what is grace? Is there a grace period for second dose COVID vaccine? Yes, they do allow that four day grace period for your second dose of COVID. Four days, not five days. Correct, because then five days turns into six and then six turns into seven. So it's only four days. I always like relating that to you can't drive when you're 15 days or 15 years old and 363 days. It, you know, you drive at 16. You don't drink at almost 21, you drive or you drink at 21. Yeah. Right. But also keep in mind that some places are not um, are not allowing that four day grace period. So there are some there are some um, pharmacies that are not allowing that four day grace period. So if you go in early, you may not be able to get it. Right. For a client. And there is no maximum max time period. Just when you get them again, you get them again. We recommend, what is it? 21 days for Pfizer, 28 yeah. for Moderna. Right, but if it, if it ends up being longer than that, you just go ahead and immunize. You don't need to repeat just like other vaccines. There, and there is also, um, there's no waiting time, no waiting period between COVID infection and COVID vaccination. Um, the only time there's a waiting period is if a patient has received monoclonal antibodies. Um, but if they did not receive monoclonal antibodies and they're symptom free, um, then you can immunize. What is monoclonal antibodies? What does that mean? Don't, I really can't explain it. It's just that you give them antibodies. I mean, it's a short term. It, it's like any other um, passive immune response. You give them and it, it increases your immune response and then you don't get a sick. It's almost like a antiviral for flu. So it's just the patient would know if they get those because they have some sort of immuno thing going on? Um, you know what? We just normally ask, did you, did you get monoclonal antibodies? And most people have been able to say yes or no. Okay. Yeah. It's on this screening checklist, I know. Yeah. And I think that's mostly when they're hospitalized. And I think that you have to get it to like an IV, don't you? So it's mm -hmm. not an easy, yeah. you know, they didn't pick one up from the local pharmacy. They were hospitalized, were sick enough to receive it. Mm -hmm. Not next to day well, you're saying. Correct. It is not next to day. Yeah. They're doing infusions outpatient, okay. So the, yeah, they are. Yeah, they are, because they want you to get it as soon as, um, they want you to get it as soon as you're diagnosed, um, if you fall into a high-risk period, a high-risk category. Because um, it's like, again, the earlier you get it, the better off you are. So if a person says they still have antibodies from their positive COVID virus, should they wait till they don't? No, they do not have to wait till they don't. Um, I had COVID last July, July. Um, I was donating plasma and still had antibodies until the day before I got my vaccine. So you do not have to wait. Some providers are waiting a little bit. Yeah, some providers are waiting. But that's more just to weaken the immune response. Not weaken the immune response to. Sometimes if you have circulating antibodies from disease, um, sometimes your immune response may be a little more robust. Yeah. Um, because if you think about it, you get that vaccine and your body's going to build a response, but your body already has a response. And so it's kind of fighting with itself. Um, so sometimes you do feel a little 
more icky than you might. Yeah. So if your provider is having their office wait, you know, 90 days or something, they're not raw. That's good. They're just trying to protect you from having a really um, awful immune response. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I think we're good. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.